Doesn't carbon-14 dating disprove the Bible? Does radiocarbon disprove the Bible? Absolutely not. In fact, we're going to see that it's a great asset to us. But let's discuss what radiocarbon and dating is all about. It's otherwise known as carbon-14 dating, and it is based on the carbon-14 atom. Radiocarbon, most people think of carbon-14 or radiocarbon as being used to date rocks. Well, in fact, you can't date rocks with radiocarbon for two reasons. One, because most rocks don't contain carbon, but more importantly, radiocarbon decays very rapidly. To give you, uh, put it in perspective, radiocarbon de decays so quickly that if every atom of the Earth was radiocarbon, within just one million years, there'd be no radiocarbon atoms left. It will all have decayed away, which is why geologists don't use radiocarbon to, say, date fossils, simply because the fossils they believe are millions of years old. And uh, I was involved in a research study recently where we took coal samples from coal that was 40 million years old, supposedly, down to coal that was supposedly 300 million years old. And we sent it to a major laboratory, a recognised university laboratory for radiocarbon, and every one of those coal samples contained radiocarbon in it, detectable radiocarbon. And we fully expected that they would contain radiocarbon because most of the world's major laboratories have already reported radiocarbon in coal, in limestone and fossils, but they, they don't think about it in terms of an age, a true age for the rocks. And it didn't matter whether the coal was supposedly 40 million years old or 300 million years old, it had the same amount of detectable radiocarbon in it and it gave a young age of only tens of thousands of years. Similarly, I've collected uh, shells in rocks that are supposed to be 150, 120 million years old in Northern California, and they also give a radiocarbon age of tens of thousands of years. Now that makes sense because the coal was laid down during Noah's flood. It's plants that were fossilized in beds during the flood. So they all were fossilized, buried and fossilized in the same year long event. So we'd expect them to give the same radiocarbon age. Of course, that radiocar those radiocarbon ages are based on the assumption that radiocarbon has always been produced in the atmosphere at the rate we find today. We know that the Earth's magnetic field was stronger in the past, which means that the radiocarbon production rate would have been slower in the past which means that those dates are highly inflated. When we take into account what the radiocarbon was like at the time of the flood, those ages of tens of thousands years of years come down to about four to five thousand years. We even tested diamonds for radiocarbon and found that they did contain radiocarbon. Diamonds are found inside the earth at very great depths and they are part of the initial makeup of the earth. So these diamonds give a young radiocarbon age, which implies that the Earth is, is very young. So in fact, when we look at the real hard facts of radiocarbon dating and the results that we get, we find that radiocarbon actually agrees with the Bible, confirms what the Bible has already said about Earth history, that the Earth is young and that was a global catastrophic flood. How many of you started drifting away somewhere in the middle there? Ah. See, this is an issue. You have to do a little work if you're going to really investigate some of the science of this and not just leave it to the guys in the white coats. I understood that this, is, this guy is not the most exciting and captivating person in the world, but there's some incredible truth here. If you were listening through the fog of drifting, what did we learn about carbon dating here? Number one, it can't be used to date rocks. It can't be used to give millions of years results, only thousands of years. Also, carbon dating has proven that fossils and coal that are supposed to be millions of years old aren't. The evidence once again fits perfectly into a global flood. But evolutionists refuse to see it precisely because they don't want to see it and they've written it off of their possibilities. The doctrine, their doctrine of millions of years gets in the way. That also comes out clearly in the methods they use to date the rocks called radiometric dating. 
Again, I don't want you to check out here. It's a little bit more complicated with um, radioactive uranium and polonium decay rates and radio halos found in there. And so I'm not going to give you another video on that. But the same thing holds true. They've sent the same rock, folks, to different laboratories around the world anonymously. The same rock gives millions and billions of years different rates, recordings of ages. So no, dating methods do not prove that the earth is millions of years old. In fact, if we had time, we'd, we'd get into literally hundreds of processes that give the earth an age of thousands of years, not millions or billions, including the amount of salt in the sea, the amount of helium in the air, the decay rate of the Earth's magnetic field, and so on. The rates at which those things are added or taken away from the systems in our world show all of them only thousands of years. For instance, the rate at which comets disintegrate shows that they can only be thousands of years old, not millions of years, and yet they keep coming around. Scientists are so confused about that that they have simply developed an imaginary Oort cloud outside of Pluto that they just proclaim exists and every now and then a comet you know, jumps out of the Oort cloud into our solar system. There's no evidence for it. They simply declare it must exist. Now that the New Horizons spacecraft has passed by Pluto, I'm sure they'll be looking for it. By the way, anyone see any news on the New Horizons spacecraft? A little bit this week? Okay. What did they expect to find on the surface of Pluto that they didn't? Anybody know? Craters. Craters. If it was millions and billions of years old, it should be filled with impact craters of space stuff that runs into the planet. They're not there. In fact, Dr. John Spencer, an investigator of the New Horizons mission, says, we have not yet found a single impact crater in the images of Pluto they've seen so far. What's his response? <laughs> this is great. We'll have to get a little more clever in interpreting the evidence. That pretty much describes it, folks. Clever science, not objective science. So what's the point to all this? Why bother investigating the dating methods or worrying about millions of years? Why not just leave the science to the scientists and just preach Jesus? Well, why not? And if we're going to preach Jesus, what are we going to preach? How about the part where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? How about when he said, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So was Jesus about the truth? Absolutely. Now, did Jesus say anything about evolution? No. But he had a lot to say about the Creator and the reliability of Genesis. For example, when Jesus gives us the origin and definition of marriage, he quoted Genesis as fact and said, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Five times Jesus referred to Noah and the worldwide flood as real history. For instance, when he warns this world, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. In fact, Jesus treated all of the scriptures as historical fact including the following accounts. As we've said, Adam and Eve as the first married couple, Abel as the first prophet who was martyred, Noah and the flood, Moses and the serpent, Moses and manna, Lot and his wife, the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, the miracles of Elijah, and by the way, yes, Jonah and the big fish. So, did Jesus get these details right or did he get them wrong? Did he testify to the truth or did he testify to a fairy tale? 
Folks, Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible says that all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. If he couldn't get this stuff right, then why even bother? Again, this is not just an intellectual discussion, folks. It is not just information. This is a battle for the truth and for your eternal destiny. Jesus stands solidly behind Genesis. And what does Genesis teach? We heard it earlier. Genesis says that God made the heavens and the earth in six days. And that is exactly what we believe. Unfortunately, many of our Christian brothers and sisters and even pastors and popes have given in to the groupthink pressure of millions of years. The scientists say, the Bible's not true. These rock layers show the earth is millions of years old. You have to believe me. I'm a scientist. The theologian says, well, I guess I'll just accept the millions of years and add it somehow to the Bible. They put the evolutionary scientists on a pedestal and just ignorantly believed in them over the only one who was there and had it all recorded for us in the pages of his word. It was just very sad to see how the church itself became corrupted, started destroying the very foundation on which it was built. Over the years, church people have developed all kinds of ways to try and squeeze millions of years into Genesis. This includes the idea of theistic evolution, that God used the process of evolution to create. The day age theory, where each day of creation is a large age of the earth. The gap theory, where there's a huge gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Progressive creation, I, I think that's an interesting one because that's one where they admit that there are no transitional fossils found in the fossil record. In other words, if evolution was true, then one kind of creature has to jump into another kind of creature and so on. Uh, they have nice you know, pictures of that, but that's all they are, it's pictures, because there's no transitional forms. It's not just missing links we're looking for, there's a whole missing chain. And they recognize that in a fossil record, but they still want to support evolution. So that theory says that every hundred million years or so, God just peeked into creation and made some new stuff, progressive uh, creation. They've also created a local flood theory to interpret the flood account in the Bible as though the, uh, to the people living in Mesopotamia, it seemed like a gl global flood, so that's the way they wrote down the account, but it was really just a local flood. Folks, we could spend hours debunking all of those flawed theories, and I'd lose you again. Come back if you've been drifting. What all of those theories have in common is that they bring man's flawed theories to the Bible instead of letting the Bible speak for itself. And of course, every time you do that, you erode the foundation on which the Bible stands or falls, the book of Genesis. I just want to challenge you once again to please read that book or reread it. And if you read it honestly, you cannot fit millions of years into the days of creation. I wish, for instance, I had a dollar for every time someone has said to me, well, we don't know how long a day was. After all, doesn't the Bible say to God a thousand years is like a day? Yes, it does. In Second Peter, the Bible also says in the same verse that to God, a thousand years are like a day. What's your point? The Bible says it's like a thousand years, not that it is a thousand years. We don't set aside the rules of grammar when we read the Bible. Besides, if you want to make room for evolution, you need a lot more than 6,000 years of creation. You need billions of years, and it is just not there in the Bible. What is there in Genesis 1 is worded deliberately so that we could not misunderstand. How could we get it wrong? There was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. There was evening and there was morning the third day, and so on throughout the six days. By the way, did you ever stop to think how we got the seven-day work week? Where did we get that idea? I mean, a day is easy. That's one rotation of the earth with respect to the sun. Then a month is approximately one rotation of the moon around the earth, and a year is one complete rotation of the earth around the sun. All of that makes sense. But where did we get a week? 
There's no heavenly phenomenon for that. Folks, that comes us straight from God and straight from our Exodus reading. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Wouldn't it be an interesting seventh day if we ever got to that, if the days were all millions of years long? That'd be a long rest, wouldn't it? Nobody would be working for millions of years. Isn't it fascinating that no matter how much people seem to want to get away from God, He still shows up all around the world. People order their lives around a seven-day week, all because God once told us that's the rhythm that will best work out for you. I want to come back to Genesis and ask you, where did death come from? Where did death come from? Genesis 1 says six times that God called His creation good. And when he finished creating on day six, he called everything very good. Man and animals and birds lived in perfect harmony, and they all ate plants, not each other. That's what the Bible says. Now imagine for a moment Adam and Eve in the garden marveling at God's creation. Oh, Adam, says Eve, this is such a perfect world. Yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said. And that's how the Bible describes it. Genesis 1, 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. All that he had made must have included all the animals, plants, man, stars, angels, etc. There's no rebellion, no death, no disease, no bloodshed. Everything was very good. But it wasn't if Adam and Eve were sitting on layers and layers of millions of years of evolution with a fossil record that shows death, disease, bloodshed, suffering, thorns, and so on. Please don't fall into that trap of trying to squeeze millions of years into the Bible just because the men in white coats say it must be so. It doesn't fit. And biblical Christians do not drag somebody's false theories to the Bible in order to reinterpret it. We let the Bible speak for itself. And the Bible says that death, disease, and suffering did not occur until after the fall of man into sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death and suffering are in the world because of sin, because Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and they made the conscious decision that they would be the ones to determine good and evil for themselves and not God. Wow, have we not repeated ourselves in every day and age. They ate the forbidden fruit, they brought sin and death into the world, and they passed it on to us, and we keep repeating their stupid mistake. That's the bad news. The good news is that God so loved the world and you in it that he did something about sin. Namely, he sent his one and only son to take that sin into himself, to take the punishment for it so that you could be forgiven and set free from it. That is the very heart of our faith, folks. That's why we're here. And that's what people want to rip out of the Bible to make room for their flawed theories. Again, if evolution is true, Then millions of years of death, disease, and suffering occurred before the first man and woman ever came on the scene. Instead, the Bible teaches us the truth. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Both those models... For the origin of life in mankind cannot be true. And to accept millions of years of death before the creation and fall of man contradicts and destroys what the Bible teaches about death and about the work of Jesus for you. If there wasn't a real tree, a real garden, a real Adam and Eve who really ate from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from and brought sin, death, and suffering into the world, then why did Jesus come? If we're not sinners who need a Savior, why did Jesus come and die for us? By the way, evolution turns God into a bumbling, cruel creator who couldn't get it right in the first place, and so he had to use millions of years of disease, disasters, and death to do his work, and then he sat back and called it all good. Folks, you have a choice to make. I hope that I've helped you make it today, or at least started you on that path. Are you going to trust the word of men who have an agenda against God and have nothing but flawed theories to back them up, and you're going to trust them just because they wear a white coat? Or are you going to take the word of God who was there at the beginning and knows everything and had it all recorded in the Bible and literally died for a relationship with you? Let's pray. God the Father Almighty, we confess you 
to be the maker of heaven and earth. You remind us in your word that since the creation of the world, your eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. And yet, O oh Lord, your servants are living in a time and among a people who are rejecting that truth. Many who believe in you waver also in their faith. And Lord, I know there's people in these pews today who have deep questions. Lord, I pray for your truth to prevail, the truth of your word, the truth we can also see if we're willing to open our eyes in your world. Lord, help each of us to play a role in giving answers to everyone who asks us to give a reason for the hope that we have. We pray it in the name of he who gives us hope, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes our ability to even understand it, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.